Hello, and welcome to today's Better Care, Care Playbook webinar, made possible through the support of the Seven Foundation Collaborative. My name is Alexandra Cruz, and I am a senior fellow at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Today, we are discussing the need for state policymakers to understand Medicare to be able to advance Medicare and Medicaid integration, examining both state and enrollee perspectives on this important topic. On the next slide, we'll go through some logistics. To eliminate background noise, audio lines are being muted during today's event. However, we do want to hear from you. There will be a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. You may um, also submit a question anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Also, today's event will be recorded and shared publicly on the bettercareplaybook.org website. On the next few slides, I'm going to review our agenda, introduce our speakers, and offer some background for today's session. Next slide. So we are excited for today's agenda. Uh, the first segment on our agenda is going to provide a brief overview of state efforts to improve alignment across the Medicare and Medicaid program before highlighting some of the key features of the integration landscapes in Iowa, California and Tennessee, the three states that are featured today. Our next segment will begin with an enrollee perspective on some of the challenges integrated programs are trying to solve for. And then our state panelists will also take us through their state's Medicare capacity building stories or journey. We will then narrow our focus a little bit and discuss some key areas where state panelists have been working to build Medicare knowledge and we will end today with a moderated question and answer period. So as questions come to you throughout the webinar, uh, please drop them in that Q&A box located below, and we'll get to as many as possible towards the end of the session. On the next slide, I'll introduce our presenters. So as mentioned, I'm Alexandra Cruz, um, a senior fellow at the Center for Healthcare Strategies, and I'm really excited to welcome our, our panelists today. So I'd first like to welcome Anastasia Dodson, who's a deputy director of the Office of Medicare Innovation and Integration at the California Department of Healthcare Services. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Barbara Merkel, who is a duly eligible individual joining us today to share her valuable perspective. Um, and also, I'm pleased to welcome Susan Van Horn, who's a program manager um, over dual eligible and third party liability policy at the Iowa Department of Health and Human Services. And finally, last but not least, joining us today is Lolitha Gilbert, who's Assistant Director of DSNIP and PACE in the Long Term Services and Supports Division with TenCare. On our next slide, I'll quickly introduce you to the Better Care Playbook. So for those of you who may not be familiar, the Playbook is an online resource center for evidence-based and promising practices to improve care for people with complex health and social needs. Every month, the Playbook summarizes new journal articles, evaluations, and implementation tools. The Playbook also develops resources like this webinar uh, designed to help translate evidence, research, best practices into broader uh, use. You can explore the playbook at the bettercareplaybook.org website. And on the next slide, I just want to take a moment to share some information about the funders that support the playbook. So the playbook is coordinated by the Center for Healthcare Strategies through support from these leading national healthcare foundations, um, Arnold Ventures, Commonwealth Fund, the John A. Hartford Foundation, the Millbank Memorial Fund, Peterson Center on Healthcare, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the SCAN Foundation. We are grateful to these organizations for supporting this work. Now I'm going to take a moment and introduce CHCS's Medicare Academy initiative that each of our state speakers um, joining us today actually participated in. So in January of 2022, the Center for Healthcare Strategies launched the Medicare Academy initiative with support from Arnold Ventures, the Commonwealth Fund, and the SCAN Foundation. The primary goal of the Medicare Academy has been to enhance the Medicare knowledge of Medicaid and partner agencies, enabling them to both develop and oversee effective Medicare and Medicaid integration programs. 
In 2023, participating Medicaid programs included California, Colorado, Hawaii, Maine, North Carolina, Texas, Virginia, Washington, and Wisconsin. And in 2024, we were um, had the privilege to work with Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Massachusetts, New York, North Dakota, Ohio, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, and Tennessee. Through this initiative, CHCS has not only worked directly with these states, but we've also been able to develop some valuable resources, including a Medicare Advantage Policy Basics video series and a Building Medicare Knowledge blog series. Both of these were designed to provide essential insights and foundational knowledge on Medicare-related topics. While these were developed to support state policymakers, others working to build Medicare knowledge may find these helpful. So now we are ready to dive in. So we can go to the next slide. And um, we're gonna start off by sharing a brief overview again of state efforts um, to improve alignment across Medicare and Medicaid before I turn things over to our state panelists to talk about their integration landscapes. So state and federal policymakers are increasingly prioritizing the development of integrated programs for the over 13 million individuals that are duly eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. Integrated programs aim to address misalignments and complexities that arise from having separate Medicare and Medicaid systems by focusing on things like smoother care transitions, improved access to care, and better health health outcomes for enrollees. The state programs that have developed these programs um, or the states that have developed these programs predominantly utilize Medicare Advantage Dual Eligible Special Needs Plans or DSNPs as a means for achieving greater alignment and care integration between Medicare Advantage and their Medicaid Managed Care programs. States also continue to partner with provider-based organizations that operate the Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, or PACE, in specific geographies. To effectively leverage these opportunities, though, state Medicaid agencies that already know all there is to know about Medicaid um, must also develop the capacity to understand and navigate the Medicare program, particularly the Medicare Advantage program. We're going to learn about this from our state speakers today who have gone down the path of building Medicare knowledge and from our work with state Medicaid agencies. We also know they need to understand and value the experiences of duly eligible individuals, which is another important part of today's conversation. Um, I'm really excited to hear from our speakers today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Lolita, Anastasia, and Susan who are gonna present brief overviews of their integration landscapes. And Nancy's dropping a resource into the chat for those who might be new to the terminology that we'll be covering today. So thanks and welcome Lolita. Good morning, I'm Lolita Gilbert. Um, I uh, oversee our DSNIP program in the state of Tennessee. In Tennessee, um, DSNIP is under the 10 Care Bureau. 10 Care Bureau oversees and administers the Medicaid program. Um, so under 10 Care, again, um, our LTSS Long-Term Services and Supports Division um, houses our DSNIP program um, as one of many programs that we have. Um, our landscape landscape with DSNIP includes six plans. Um, that includes three of which that have our fully integrated DSNPs. Um, they have the Medicaid managed care contracts in addition to um, the, the DSNIP plan. So they are our aligned plans. We also have three, what we call coordination only plans that only administer the DSNIP Medicare services. Um, in Tennessee, we are increasingly um, utilizing the additional state authority that is afforded to us to um, provide services to the DSNIP population. Um, our focus has been in the past to increase enrollment for our fully integrated dual eligible special needs plans because we know that is the best benefit for dual recipients and the best benefit for the state overall. Um, in the past, we have uh, utilized that authority to limit the enrollment for the FIDE SNP program 
So individuals who received our choices uh, benefit or who were enrolled in the choices program were the only ones who were eligible to enroll in our FIDE program. So moving forward, beginning January 1st, 2026, we will open that FIDE enrollment um, to include all fully benefit dual eligible individuals so that we can provide those fully integrated and coordinated services to as many members as we possibly can. Next slide. So um, TenCare, again, the our work is led uh, by myself, who's the assistant director. Um, I report to our director of dual eligible operations and initiatives. Um, the director also oversees our main program under LTSS, which is Choices. And together, we serve our duals population. Um, in the beginning, when we first started looking at the work and looking at how we would expand that FIDE population, which again is the main priority for the state of Tennessee, we wanted to conduct an analysis to determine where the duels were in all of our programs under LTSS. Um, so we completed an analysis of every single program. And what we found was that there was a large number of duels that were enrolled in all of our programs. So that information really led us to really understand that the work did not need to be limited, but we needed to expand the work across TenCare in all of the divisions and all of the individuals who served the duals population. Um, some of you are probably familiar um, in your state as well that the knowledge around the duals is very limited because of that Medicare knowledge um, that, that you need to have to really administer the program. So a lot of individuals that touch the the duals population may not be familiar with DSNP and know all the benefits um, of the program. So our main initiative was to connect with all of the program leads, um, individuals who were on our quality team, who received uh, reporting and led um, um, assessments like NCIAD, um, those who touched um, the social determinants of health reporting um, in, in, in every area under 10 care, if it was behavior health, fiscal data governance, all areas needed to be um, educated on the duals population so that they understood the significance of the program and how we could better serve the duals that were in the state of Tennessee. So once we completed that analysis, um, we then developed a training. Um, and a lot of that came from some of the uh, work that we received while we attended the Medicare Academy, um, some of the um, resources that we received uh, participating in some of the other um, webinars that we attended. But we developed a training and one by one, uh, we have educated all the areas that internally touch um, the DSNIP program. Again, if it's quality, behavior, health, fiscal data. Um, so so I think now we have um, a lot of individuals who know probably more than they wanted to know, um, but they have a lot of uh, uh, more knowledge around DSNIP. Um, so now our focus is extending that training to our external partners. Next slide. So we're gonna welcome Anastasia to talk about California's landscape for a few minutes. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Great topic and interesting to hear about other states. So in California, we have some existing integrated plans and we're looking to expand the availability of integrated DSNPs throughout the state. And thanks again to Alex for, you know, setting us up with some of the terminology. But um, <clears throat> Medicaid members in California, including people who are dually eligible, are almost all enrolled in Medicaid managed care but there are some services that are carved out, but the people are enrolled in, in Medicaid, we call it Medi-Cal Managed Care Plan, um, and facility-based long-term care, skilled nursing facility, et cetera, care is carved in. That's part of what the Medicaid Managed Care Plans administer. Um, we have DSNPs that are sometimes, you know, the terminology coordination only, but they do meet all the applicable integrated plan requirements for integrated care. They are available right now in 12 counties in 2024. And then in 2026, we're planning to have them available for 30 additional counties <clears throat> through 10 new uh, plans. So that's a big focus that we're working on right now. It's voluntary enrollment. 
um, but we're excited to have the, to expand the availability of those integrated DSNPs. We also have a FIDE SNP that's available in four large counties, and then PACE is also available in numerous counties. The, for sense of scale, there's 58 counties in California. So, but the again, the counties where um, our our AIP DSNPs, those 12 counties, um, and the FIDE SNP, those are um, our large Southern California counties. So as far as resources at the Department of Healthcare Services, which is where I work, that's the um, state Medicaid agency. Um, there's a small team, the Office of Medicare Innovation and Integration, that works on um, alignment um, integration policy for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, but there are many teams throughout the department, throughout DHCS, that are engaged in integration activities and understanding Medicare. So third-party liability, of course, um, our data team, the managed care um, policy and contracting team, our um, finance team, pharmacy, dental, and, and other benefit teams. So, um, but what we try to do in the um, Office of Medicare Innovation and Integration is to, you know, connect the dots. We're working on a um, Part A buy-in uh, process. We're, we're, we're changing a policy there and we're seeing, okay, we need to make sure everybody internal and external knows what's going on. So we're supporting that, but we have a good good team of experts on various topics. So I think that's it for my uh, three minutes, Alex. We'll go to the next person. Yeah, absolutely perfect. Thank you for the overview. And now Susan is going to join us to talk about Iowa for a minute. Good morning. Uh, once again, my name is Susan Van Horn, and I work with the State of Iowa Medicaid Program. I'm housed in the Bureau of Quality, Innovation, and Medical Policy. I've been with the agency since January 2023 as a policy program manager for dual eligibles and third party liability. Prior to joining Iowa Medicaid, I bring 20 plus years of public health and hands on clinical experience. And I'm happy to join you today to discuss Iowa's journey into, into the world of Medicare and Medicaid integration. So our integration focus for Iowa, our overarching focus in the last 12 months has been to map out both our current and future contracting opportunities with our DSNPs. Our mapping efforts have ultimately led us to kind of a multi-phase approach that promotes both aligned contracts and enrollment. Um, to give you a little uh, landscape highlight, uh, Iowa's current landscape, Iowa has a Medicaid fee-for-service program and then also has three Medicaid MCOs that cover both behavioral health services and long-term services and supports. At the end of state fiscal year 2024, Iowa had a total of en enrollment of just over 700,000 total members and about 35,000 members enrolled in a decent plan. And uh, Iowa also has, about, has 99 counties. Um, our DSNP plans cover the majority, each plan covers the majority of the 99 counties. So the contracting stat strategy for our state Medicaid agency contracts or SMACs with DSNPs is evolving. Our three MCOs are currently on a different contracting cycle. One of the MCOs was reprocured this year to start a new contract on 7-1 of 2025. And Iowa plans to reprocure the other two MCO contracts in 2026 for an anticipated 7-1 2027 start. This will align our three MCOs on the same contract cycle with an anticipated contract end date of initial end date of 2031. This is one of the key aspects of our integration landscape that has influenced our approach to lead a more phased integration plan. For our DSNPs then, for calendar year 2025, Iowa will hold SMACs with five DSNPs. Then for calendar year 2026, we plan to have one fully integrated DSNP operating with exclusively aligned enrollment. And then for calendar year 2027, we plan to have all three of our MCOs operating DSNPs with an exclusively aligned enrollment. Next, I'll discuss some of the resource investments or strategies that have supported our efforts. If you go to the next slide. So uh, my role is a new role. It's a policy manager role. The focus of this position has been to develop and offer subject matter expertise 
has been responsible for identifying Medicare and Medicaid, Medicaid integration options. And because this role is housed within the Quality Innovation and Medical Policy Bureau, I'm able to work closely with the other policy managers for areas such as pharmacy, DME, maternal health, dental, behavioral health, and look at integration options and impacts. The one of our resources has been to look at uh, to establish dedicated points of contacts. We've spent the last 12 months really trying to team build by establishing points of contacts and defining roles and requirements for those contacts. We focus the work of the new point of contacts in an eligibility division, division which has actually been separated from Medicaid, um, has led to a little bit of siloing that we're trying to cross that bridge of. We have a Bureau of Contracting that's um, slowly becoming more involved in the development of the SMAC contracts. We've also un onboarded the three uh, contract managers that manage our MCO contracts to help uh, start looking at SMAC oversight. And we're also developed contract requirements for the recently procured Medicaid contracts for the MCOs, uh, the Medicaid contracts for our quality improvement organization, QILM program integrity service vendor teams that specifically identifies a SME with Medicare knowledge in those two contracts. So we're looking to build up our outside resources as well. Uh, we're also focusing on learning from stakeholders with relevant experience. Our current SMAC vendors have been a great source of information. We're working on developing a regular cadence of meetings with our SMAC contract vendors, our state health insurance assistant program. We're starting to meet with our IT vendor to look at cross floor and enrollment information. And then some of our planned upcoming activities include reaching out to LTSS divisions, the Division of Aging, and behavioral staff internally to help us identify other professional organizations and member groups that we could reach out to. Thank you. Next slide. So um, thank you uh, to each of the state panelists for giving us a little bit of background on your landscapes, your resources, kind of what um, has led yours, guiding your work to build capacity um, and understand Medicare. What we'd like to do now is welcome, um, as we kick off our next segment on enrolling in state perspectives on building Medicare capacity, is welcome Barbara Merkel um, to join us and share her thoughts. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the enrollee perspective because for um, all of us, I think a critically important area for capacity building among plans, providers, and policymakers is being able to understand things from an enrollee perspective. So we're really lucky to have Barbara joining us to share her experience navigating her own care needs as a duly eligible individual. Uh, Barbara, I was hoping, I know you're um, off mute, don't know if you're able to come off camera, that's perfect, that's lovely, yep. um, great to see you. Um, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about whether it's been hard or challenging for you to get the care that you need when some of it's covered by Medicare and some by Medi-Cal, which is the name used for California's Medicaid program. For example, have you encountered challenges trying to find providers. Um, would love to get some thoughts from you to help our audience understand things a bit better. I've had a lot I've had a lot of challenges trying to find providers and uh, I think a lot of it is that the providers don't know uh, you know what they are what are they, what they're covering and what they're not covering and where they fall in the range of things. Um, and you know, I'll call my plan and I'll say, I'm looking for, you know, someone who does X. And, you know, I get a list of like 32 people and then I start calling all these people and then the people don't even know, you know, am I Medicare, am I Medi-Cal, you know, uh, what do I do with this person who now is telling me I'm a dual, you know, she's a dual, like a dual person because they don't understand what that means. Um, and so I think a lot of that is not having the providers understand what's going on to begin with. Um, and also having the people at the you know plan level understand when they're presenting these things to people, you know, can they can they provide people who are really going to be able to to help them to do something? Um 
you know, I uh, actually found that I use my, um, excuse me, my PCP um, and my, you know, specialist a lot. Um, and, you know, because now that I've been doing this for two years now, um, they seem to have, you know, more information, I think, than a lot of the other, um, uh, uh, you know, like any any other people. And, you know, I can't just call it blindly. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll have issues with, uh, you know, vendors. And, you know, I had issues with a, a dentist who, you know, kept telling me that, you know, he was both. And, you know, I found out he wasn't. And he was charging me, you know, a lot of money every quarter. Um, and, uh, you know, it took me a long time to figure that out. Um, I'm going through some other little stuff right now, <laughs> equipment and things like that, you know, and, uh, you know, and honestly, I mean, I'm a fighter, so I fight back, um, you know, and I say that doesn't make any sense and, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, I will go back and, you know, go to the plan. I'll go to, you know, whoever I need to go to um, and, you know, basically yell at the um you know, at the, at the person that is not giving me the machine that I want or whatever and, and charging me money for it now, all of a sudden, out of nowhere. Um, you know, so it's, it's a lot of like advocating for yourself, I think. And I don't, um, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, kind of need to be brought into that kind of, you know, thought process when they're starting this, because, you're, you're going to run into it. It's, you know, you're dealing with two different, um, you know, uh, two different medical uh, plants when you're, when you're talking about, you know, you're on a plan, but there's two different, you know, they're, they're, the billing is separate. And, you know, if your person doesn't know which one they're supposed to bill, then it becomes a mess. And some people do, um, you know, my foot guy knows that, you know, he bills Medi-Cal first, I think, before he bills Medicare, you know, but then another guy bills Medicare before he, you know, does Medi-Cal. So it's, but they need to know that before they walk into the situation. And um, it's just been, you know, it's been interesting to say the least in a lot of cases. Um, but, uh, you know, Again, I think it's, you know, all about advocating for yourself and just fighting, you know, and saying, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to, you know, just, you know, lay down and take this because someone out there is is going to be able to help you and you need to go back to your plan and, you know, fight it with your plan. So it's, it's interesting what you're sharing because um, it's worth recognizing the significant effort that you've put into um, finding answers to challenges that you've encountered. And, you know, and we've talked about this once before, but like a lot of the things that you experience have come up for other people. But do you think others in your shoes would be able to kind of do the same level of advocacy? Or, you know, I mean, you, you recognized yourself as a fighter, mm -hmm. which is um, incredibly important um, in life in general, but welcome thoughts on that. Um, I don't know, but I think that if, um, if there's a way to get that across to people within their plans to say, if this isn't working for you, you need to, you know, you need to get back to us. You need to use us as your advocates because, you know, your plans are advocates too. And they really can do a good job for you as far as advocating also. They're not just going to say, you know, good night, you know, I mean, although they have before in my case too, fight them too. But, um, you know, it's like, you just, you yes. know, they're not, there's always someone there's, you know, you're, you have a care coordinator, you have someone in there who is going to, you know, like figure this out um, and help you to figure it out. And you just have to keep, calling and keep pushing and things like that and yes i know that some people don't have the kind of personality that's going to be able to do that um and you know you need to i guess what it is what i'm saying is that it's it's kind of has to be brought to their attention 
that you're allowed. And um, my plan actually has a lawyer um, that, you know, we go to and, you know, we can uh, like use the lawyer um, uh, as legal aid and we can use the legal aid people and they, you know, they know about, you know, all the ins and outs of all the, you know, Medicare and Medi-Cal and whatever, and they can also assist us if right. need be. You know, um, you brought up to your specialist, your PCP, like the fact that there's trusted providers as well yeah. as the role of a care coordinator. But like, it's great advice for people to be thinking about, um, particularly if there's providers and plans listening on this webinar today, right, to be thinking about how important they are in helping um, people navigate these things and the value of also right care coordination to support folks. So um, this is super helpful. I appreciate you weighing in on those um, important questions. I know um, we wanna spend some time talking as well about um, our state panelists experience trying to build their, their Medicare knowledge. And so they're each gonna shift now um, and talk a little bit about their stories. And so mm -hmm. at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next um, state panelist. We can move to our next slide and welcome Anastasia back to talk about California's Medicare capacity building journey. Thanks, Alex, and thank you, Barbara. Really excellent points you made and w well taken. And, you know, we definitely have room for improvement. And just thank you very much. And um, sorry that it is not working as smoothly as it should, but I think we're all kind of on a journey to continue to improve um, care coordination. So in California, we've had kind of a combination of factors in the last 10 or actually more than 10 years. So um, we had we participated in the financial alignment demonstration um, that um, did start was operational 10 years ago, but certainly we had years before to plan. Um, and we've had Medicaid waivers um, for many years. And then in the most recent um, 2020, when we looked at, okay, our one of our 1115, our 1115 waivers expiring, and then the financial alignment demonstration, you know, there was clear that need to be transitioned to the DSNIP platform. So that led us to um, kind of work on a plan in um, actually late 2019 and 2020. Um, to um, in, then in combination with, again, in 2019 and 2020, our governor developed a uh, master plan for aging with many stakeholders, many um, work streams on that. And so that master plan for aging prioritized Medicare integration and home and community-based services. And we also have very large number um, compared to other states of people who are duly eligible. So <clears throat> not just because we're a large state, but because the income threshold that we have for Medicaid, Medi-Cal um, is higher than in, in some other states. So we do have um, a large population, our master plan for aging, and then this federal authority thing was um, evolving. So then that's how we got to this um, transit, the strategy to, expect, to um, transition to the DSNIP model, make it an integrated model that is similar to our financial alignment demonstration, and then expand so that all of the Medi-Cal plans in California are required to have um, these types of integrated DSNPs. Um, we're, we're also building up our um, Medicare capacity in key areas. So um, data analysis, that's really important because um, we know that, you know, some things we can hear, as Barbara said, from Advocates, we have a um, ombudsman program for dual eligibles that we hear about things, you know, pills and grievances, et cetera. But data is really important. Um, diving into Medicare policy, looking at, you know, what gets proposed in proposed rules and final rules. There's lots of different webinars that we watch from other that other organizations present about Medicare, and we just have to keep learning about that. We have many internal communications and discussions. Um, and we engage with delivery system partners and CMS. So that means engagement with providers, engagement with um, provider groups, um, engagement with advocates, and of course the CMS duals office is an extremely helpful partner as well. Um, but I think just you know, as far as a, a key lesson per se, um, when we 
um, Medicare and Medicaid, they are both independently complex and dynamic, which means they change over time. And um, so, and of course, both together are especially complicated, obviously for members for and providers plans and the state too. So it is, it is quite a complex um, kind of ecosystem for, for us to understand and navigate. But setting up those integrated plans is a, has been a really helpful foundation. Um, we don't, we're not just trying to understand for the sake of understanding. We really, it's like for the plans, for the members, for the providers, it gives us a really strong sense of uh, purpose to be working on this. But certainly it is an ongoing journey and, you know, we have many years ahead to, to continue improving and thank you. Go to the next slide. Yes, we can go to the next slide. That's perfect. And then we're going to welcome Iowa to talk about um, their journey. Thank you. And I also want to thank Barbara. I really appreciate your input and the time that you've taken to speak with us. To, the billing is such an issue for our, our members and our providers, so I appreciate that perspective. So in Iowa, early on, Iowa Medicaid has actually had a couple of start and stop attempts to strengthen our DSNP contracting efforts. As I mentioned earlier, my position was established in January of 2023. This was actually part of a legislative mandated reorganization. And during the reorganization, Iowa Medicaid took a look and strategically reviewed SME coverage for key policy areas and identify, tried to identify gaps. Uh, one identified need was just for a full-time dedicated employee to be able to understand or work on understanding the integration of Medicaid and Medicare. So my policy manager position was one of the strategic first steps that allowed us to begin building our Medicaid knowledge. And the initial onboarding for me was simply an assignment to take three to four months to start exploring Medicare. And I will say, although I, I have years of experience with federal regulations, state statutes and the Iowa Administrative Code, it has been truly challenging to begin to un uh, understand the complexity of dual eligible policies. Where we're at today, um, some of the first step steps for our team have been to really try to get a solid understanding of the existing state landscape. And that's been digging into contracts for the state Medicaid agency contracts, as well as identifying language in our MCO contracts and where they may cross, where there may be gaps. Uh, we've also been working to identify and build a repository of our state and federal guidelines, just trying to get a handle on what rules uh, touch the work that we're trying to do with the dual eligible policies. And then we're also working to build a, a knowledge baseline to be able to discuss DSNPs and be able to explain the current basic structure and the importance of the services and this work for our members and the benefits that that will bring. This has also included being able to share with our leadership teams definitions. What is an API? What's coordination? What's Heidi? What's Fidey? Uh, we've also been able to tap into available resources and supports, and this includes anyone housed anywhere. Uh, for us, these resources have included ICRC, CHCS. We were fortunate enough to attend this uh, cycle of the Medicare Academy. We've been working with COB, CMS contacts, and pretty much anyone else we could include. And we find that there are many of our team members in Iowa Medicaid, as well as in other divisions, such as our Community Access Division, who have some level of institutional knowledge about dual eligibles and the policies, and we're working to try to include these co-workers and tap into the knowledge that they have, and at least in the periphery to gain guidance and support of their knowledge. So some of the key lessons that we have discovered uh, when working with Medicare, when your daily focus is on Medicaid, can be both intimidating, frustrating, and time-consuming. So far, having a person or preferably a team of dedicated staff can help both management and other team members navigate what exists and how it works or doesn't and what our future could be and how we can really prepare to strengthen the program. Our team is all relatively new with one to three years of experience in our current roles, but we have found our knowledge and ability to assist both members and other programs has expanded exponentially with a little time and a, a little bit of dedicated time and a lot of support. That's our that's our current journey. I'll turn it over to Lolita. 
Thank you, Susan. And thank you, uh, Barbara, for uh, being willing to share your experience with us. It really, I think, helps to um, adjust our perspective because uh, sometimes we can get bogged down with the day-to-day. -day. So thank you so much for allowing us to um, adjust and refocus. Um, so in Tennessee, um, I think we may not be unique in that um, we were kind of forced to prioritize building uh, our Medicaid, Medicare knowledge. Um, in 2002, the individual that ran the DSNIP program for years and served as our subject matter expert uh, retired. And there was the intention and the, uh, I guess we, we attempted to align uh, my position with her position. Uh, my position was created to bring on a dedicated person to then lead the DSNIP work in the state. Um, in our attempt to align um, her leaving and me coming on to give us a little overlap um, was it successful? So her last day was my first day on the job. Um, so we immediately found ourselves in a position where we needed to get assistance uh, with someone who could help to build that Medicare piece and to help us tie in integration and determine what the that would look like moving forward in the state. Um, not too long after I came on board, we uh, received the information about the opportunity to uh, join the Medicare Academy. We submitted the application, and unfortunately, that first year we were not selected, um, but we did not let that deter us in still seeking assistance in helping us to gain knowledge. Um, so while I was reading regulations and trying to see what we could find and meeting with the staff that had assisted with the program, uh, we were still looking for external opportunities for technical assistance. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we um, had in uh, had a meeting with um, our ventures and Altarum, and luckily we were granted um, technical assistance under Altarum AMS, uh, Altarum Medicare and Medicaid Services for States, and we've been working with them for about a year and a half. And that opportunity has been instrumental in our ability to gain the knowledge that we needed around Medicare and to look at the landscape for Medicaid and integrate those services in attempt to move the program forward. Um, the Alterum group um, that we had assigned to us initially included individuals that even had access on the plan side. So we were able to kind of peek into to that area as well. You know, a lot of times when you're working with the plans, you don't always know exactly what to ask or know exactly what they can or can't do due to, um, you know, a number of issues. But having someone on staff who had that extensive experience working uh, for plans um, was really instrumental in us being able to move forward and allowed us to actually connect with our plans. So um, I think a lot of times you have the perspective of um, not necessarily punitive, but us wanting to be over and always driving the work. Uh, but we were really able to adjust. And now we definitely work with our plans. Um, I can at any time pick up the phone and, and call one of our plans and we can work through any particular situation or if there's some type of um, perspective or innovation or some type of idea that's been proposed, we now work together. Um, even as we build the SMACs year to year, uh, we want to include our plans in that. And we have open discussions. And a lot of times those discussions include what um, is the state's intent behind some of the initiatives or some of the changes that we would like to make. And we, we have open discussions. And I think the plans know that we have built this relationship and now we can um, work together if there's something that may not be advantageous to them or could um, potentially result in a negative impact we can have those discussions and then make those adjustments. And I think that it's it's been really, really insightful and inspiring that we have partners in the work. Um, so I think from an internal perspective, working with all of our um, internal programs and the other divisions within TenCare to know that we also have our partners, our plans that we move forward with. Um, we're really able now to build on the knowledge and now move initiatives forward within the state. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, the the time spent kind of talking about the drivers that led your agencies to spend time building Medicare capacity and some of what that work has looked like um, is really super helpful, especially kind of that broad overview. And now if we move to the next slide, what we're going to do is shift and really talk a little bit more about um, capacity building into focus. So we're going to turn to our state panelists and ask them to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the specific areas that they've been working to build Medicare capacity. So I'm going to go ahead and shift um, to Susan is going to talk about the capacity to design and build new programs and some of Iowa's experience there. Thank you. Uh, so I think it's important to remember that the individual starting point really matters. It doesn't matter what your previous work experience may have been. It, it may not fully uh, prepare you for the complexity of the dual eligible policy and program development across the Medicaid and Medicare landscape. Again, my prior work experience uh, was a lot of reading roles and trying to understand regulations, but this didn't uh, fully prepare me. So in addition to currently navigating ga gaps in our institutional knowledge, also due to staffing constraints, retirements, we have lack of historical documentation. Iowa has gone through a migration from Microsoft to Google, back to Microsoft, folders missing, history is missing. We've had to try to rebuild some of that historical institution knowledge. So. And also then this project initiated while the state was undergoing a massive organizational restructuring that have all contributed to making it challenging to be able to build and retain this momentum of this Medicare knowledge. So for charting our course forward in our discovery phase, the Iowa team has found that it is valuable to identify the who, what, and how of our current DSNP program as a baseline. And this included designing documentation that's easily understandable and can be used for reference and discussion with stakeholders with all levels of understanding. And then we have, are, have relied heavily on training and documentation from organizations such as CHCS, ICRC, and CHCS. CMS. We honestly probably still have more questions and gaps than answers a year into this process. Uh, with the complexity of a, D we have a complex uh, DSNP landscape, and that includes DSNP contract vendors that are both unaligned with an MCO and also some that are aligned with an MCO. And we have members that are heavily enrolled in the non-MCO parent DSNAPs. So we have a lot of different member scenarios to consider going forward, but we wanna make sure that our focus is firmly on member services, equity, and choice as our ultimate driver. As far as the nitty gritty of building capacity, the Medicaid Academy gave us an amazing opportunity to meet with states all along the pers uh, spectrum of program development and landscapes of different DSNP functionalities. So Iowa has also relied heavily on trainings and materials for organizations such as ICRC and CMS. And for us, a simple email to IC uh, I the ICRC Resource Center unlocked a valuable wall of resources. Um, building capacity for us has also really been about networking, networking with our stakeholders, net, building our team's knowledge base and building our documentation for continuity. Well, um, a really important place for states that are um, kind of starting out. Um, we're gonna go ahead and shift to talk on the next slide about uh, oversight, which is another really important area for states to be thinking about uh, building capacity. Would you like to jump in here, Lalitha? I would love to hear about Tennessee's experience. Might be on the um, Yeah, so for Tennessee, um, yeah, we, we, we really, um, as far as getting the the knowledge for oversight, um, we really had to focus on um, de determining where we could find those resources. Um, so we really depend heavily on the um, the reports and the data that comes directly from CMS to help us guide the program. Um, and as um, as it was previously stated, um, the the C the C excuse me CMS MMCO ICRC those trainings um, that have been provided for us I think from the very beginning for me coming on I don't think there was a training. 
stage that um, that was missed. And so those were um, extremely instrumental in helping us to get the knowledge that we needed to help us determine the tools um, that we had available to us to help uh, with providing oversight. And um, as well, like anytime we have questions as well, we know that we can send an email and, and have a meeting set up within a week to um, go through those complicated issues or complicated changes that may be coming down the pike um, in, in uh, regulation or any of those changes. And so for Tennessee, um, we have a focus uh, as far as fiscal stewardship. Um, a lot of the work that we do, um, we're always looking to see how we can create savings. So knowing that the fully integrated plans um, really can impact the savings on the state side, we've really been looking at and, and seeking a, assistance and guidance in how we can ensure that um, you know Medicaid is the payer of last resort and some of the initiatives that we can pursue in the state to ensure that we capture those savings um, for the state. And then we can utilize those savings in other ways to move our program forward. If it's um, incentive payments to ensure that coordination and integration is going the way that it can and should, uh, but just looking for um, other unique ways of addressing um, those things. Thank you, um, Lolita. The next area we're going to cover is um, a critically important area, I think, when you think about um, duly eligible individuals and the um, what we know about um, health outcomes and disparities and in health inequities that the population encounters. So um, we are going to shift to hearing from California. Anastasia is going to talk to us a little bit about um, California's perspective on thinking about building capacity to advance health equity. And also, um, Anastasia, after that, you can kind of shift, if you want, into your next slide on thinking about how you respond to the fact that the federal Medicare landscape is always changing and evolving. So I um, want to welcome Anastasia back to cover um, the next little bit of ground for us. Great. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. So we have been collecting data from DSNPs stratified by race and ethnicity. It is actually a bigger task than we originally anticipated. Um, some data is missing and um, but we're so anyway, we're looking at it and um, wanting to better understand and, and um, you know, thinking about future efforts, but then also thinking about what what data is um, collected by CMS. We have I'm going to go real technical DSNP only H contracts, which means we um, require the DSNPs to um, just have their contract cover California and only duals so that the data that CMS has is just for that population. And so we don't have to, we, we can do less um, kind of double asking of the plans. And so anyway, it's that's a work in progress and we are very interested in um, wanting to go through that a little more thoroughly. Um, the care coordination measure stratified by race and ethnicity that provides an initial um, view and again, we want to look at the CMS measures as well. Um, and the last point I want to make about health equity is that workforce issues are also related to health equity as we've had discussions um, with health plans and members, et cetera. So we have workforce strategies both at the department and in other parts of the state um, agencies to address health inequities and promote culturally competent care. I mean, uh, California is obviously very diverse state in many factors, but um, other states as well, I would imagine, you know, I think that's important. Next slide. Um, and so how do we keep abreast of all the federal Medicare changes? We look at the health news, digests, webinars, CMS um, proposed rules, their fact sheets. Um, certainly, you know, CHCS provides information. Um, but we do have internal meetings where we look at what's happening and how can we kind of, one part of our department may have heard something and we want to connect with others, um, engaging with the duals office and with health plans, providers and, and associations and trade groups, because they know they're watching as well. And it's actually a good way to learn is to see, you know, whether it's the, you know, medical association or, um, you know, the 
association of F FQHCs or association of um, IPAs or um, provider groups, they're watching. And so to listen to what are they saying is important or how are they, what comments letter are they putting in, that helps us understand. Um, and when then for internal, we have recorded trainings and slide decks and charts to help build and maintain internal knowledge. We have turnover. Um, so we just, you know, we have an internal web page. There's all the training, you know, then we put highlights in our employee newsletters. Go look at this training and people have questions, you know, graphs. Some of these people don't want to, you know, read a novel, but just look at, you know, some key graphs that'll help. Um, and then communication channels, hearing from all of our stakeholders to know what's going on. So we do have um, frequent stakeholder meetings and, you know, sometimes things that we wish we weren't hearing, but it's the truth. So we need to know. Um, and we want to identify emerging issues, you know, cannibal care organizations, other other things that are going on in the market that we need to know about. And sometimes it's hard. It's a new topic, but we have to keep learning. And so it's it's challenging, but it's in, engaging, you know, to to know that we're helping people and it's a you know a complex puzzle. We try to solve it. I'll head back to the to Alex or the next speaker. Yeah, um, I know complex and puzzle resonates um, for sure. So we're going to hear from Lolita before we um, kind of wrap up our formal um, content sharing today. Lolita is going to talk a little bit about the evolving federal Medicare landscape and and what Tennessee's experience has been um, trying to kind of maintain capacity on on that front. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we've previously discussed about, um, you know, the resources that we needed to access to, to gain knowledge and to stay on top of the ever-changing landscape of DSNIP. Um, so I will say for us, the participation in the Medicare Academy um, really created opportunities and gave us insight into a lot of resources that we had no idea about. Um, so there was a presentation on SDRC, the State Data Resource Center. Um, and after the presentation, we were able to set up a one-on-one -on -one and um, find out a lot of information in regards to the data that was coming into the state. So a lot of individuals um, and like a lot of data that we were not initially aware of. So it presented a lot of opportunities for us to connect with those individuals um, and to learn more that we were a year in and didn't even um, know that that information was coming into the state and was available um, to us uh, for us to utilize to, to move the program forward. But we're always looking for opportunities to learn more. Um, you have to, there's, everything is changing day to day. And so we have to stay abreast of everything. So if there's any webinars that's being offered, we are definitely taking part in those. I'm sure there's several of my colleagues that are on today um, to hear if there's anything from any of the states that can be shared um, that we can take advantage of. We definitely want to do that. Uh, but also um, the, the Medicare Academy and learning in these environments gives us the opportunity to reach out to those states and, and make those connections. And we do not have an opportunity to do that a lot because we don't always get an opportunity to know what other states are doing. So this is extremely beneficial for us as we try to lead our programs, but to get the perspective from the other states as well. Um, I previously mentioned that we were able to get technical assistance um, under Alterum uh, AMS division. And with that assistance, we were able to also receive training. Um, and they assist with a number of things to help because we have uh, such limited capacity and we had those staffing issues initially, they were able to help to develop training aids and to assist as we go across our divisions internally and do those external uh, trainings. They help us with that. So that has been extremely um, beneficial to us to make sure that it's everything is not on just one individual or two individuals, but we also have um, the help through that technical assistance uh, partner and the resources, the vast decades of knowledge that they have, have really helped us. Um, so in regards to how we can um, strategically work um, to support the, the state efforts, um, we, we look at all of those things. And again, not even probably thinking, oh, well, 
with this particular particular technical assistance opportunity, we can ask for these additional resources. So um, we did not try to limit ourselves in any way. Um, and, and the ask is always there. So, you know, I always say you know, the worst you can get is a no, uh, but uh, thankfully we have gotten plenty of yeses and that has been um, the thing that has really helped us to move our program forward so quickly. Thank you. Which is a great thing um, to hear about for sure. And and it's, I think your aha moment too, is that mm -hmm. you just kind of have to keep asking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because you never know what those resources might be able to help you do in terms of moving the ball down the field. So that's great. Um, we have heard a lot. We've covered a lot of ground and I want to um, shift us into our Q&A portion of the conversation and invite each of our panelists to come back on screen um, so we can kind of go through some questions. We've definitely had some really great questions come in through the Q&A function. Um, just as a reminder, you are able to um, use that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to still um, ask a question if you have one. And one of the areas that um, I think um, we talked about a little bit earlier was around oversight and just thinking about how integrated programs are working. And there's a real big value in Barbara um, coming back on camera, if you're able to, Barbara, to just offer some thoughts on what you think um, as states are really thinking about what matters to enrollees and how these programs are working. Like, as they look at their programs, what areas do you think they should focus on improving or um, what matters to you? Would be great to hear a few thoughts on just a moment. Okay, well, as an enrollee, um, I really count on my plan to have information for me. So when I call and I, I, you know, I, I get someone who knows what they're talking about and who can help me and lead me to the correct place. A lot of times I go, you know, in my plan, I'll like, it'll be like, oh, this is a plan and this is the Medicare group. And I'm like, well, I thought you were total dual, you know, so now I'm, you know, questioning and, you know, so anyway, it starts becoming this whole thing of I have to go over here and then go over here and then go over here. Anyway, so, you know, that would be helpful, Um, you know, having uh, the list of providers be accurate and to have, you know, the providers know that, you know, if they're dual, you know, what that what that means for them. You know, are they one or the other? If, you know, if they are, are they supposed to, you know, build one insurance versus the other insurance? Because that's apparently something that happens with the dual stuff. Um, so that's, you know, that's another thing. I think right now, um, I'll bring it up because it's, you know, probably something that's on a lot of people's minds um, who are enrollees and, you know, just people in general at my age and going to insurance and stuff is we don't know what's going to happen. You know, are they going to take our insurance away? Are they going to, you know, it, you know, so there's a lot of fear, I guess is what I'm saying out there right now. So how to, how to calm us down um, is another thing. <laughs> because, you know, we're all like this. What? You know, um, the messaging, yeah, it, it's, the messaging it's, is important. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, there's a lot of fear right now. And, you know, it's, it's, it's directed at our age group. Um, and, you know, we're just going, okay, you know, well, you're my age group, but you're, you know, you want to take all my stuff away, you know, like, I don't get it. But anyway, so, you know, just to, you know, like, the messaging and, and things like that. And I think I'll, another thing about messaging, too, and I think we've talked about this also, is that when you're providing information to your enrollees to make sure that it's it's clear and it's concise and that they can understand it. Even if you have to send it through 14 proofreaders to make sure that it's understandable. Because I think that um, I've seen stuff come through and I've been like, what? What are they talking about? You know, and for me, that's, you know, that's like, I need that to be very crystal clear. Especially if you're sending it to me you know, and I'm like, okay, why did you send this then? 
So just, you know, stuff like that, those just to things, be as crystal clear as possible. Yeah, I think those things really resonate. And as we go into talking about some other questions that we got from, from audience members, um, welcome, right? Any thoughts Anastasia, Lolita, or Susan have, but all everything you shared, I think really resonates in terms of like things that, that states can be, and, and plans and providers can be focused on. So um, that being said, I would love to, um, answer some of the questions that um, we have from folks. And early on, we got a question, um, which was perhaps directed to our state panelists, which was how did states get leadership support to create a team or a new position for dual eligibles and integrated initiatives? Like what has been your experience there? And, and would anybody like to jump in on that and offer some thoughts? I think we we all struggle with that. Um, so we know that there are um, fiscal restraints um, in you know staffing and things of that nature. But I think also because we in Tennessee have been very intentional about expanding the knowledge of DSNIP, I think a lot of individuals understand the the complexity level of the work. And so they see everything that we're doing. And so now when we say, okay, well, this is really growing, right? And the changes that we're making will result in this type of impact, right? We're gonna go from serving this number up to this number with these changes. Um, I think us being able to speak directly to that and expanding the knowledge across Tennessee has really helped us to gain advocates in the work um, to ensure that it's not always on just one or two individuals. Yeah, in California, you know, the work that was done on the master plan for aging and the um, kind of just having to, you know, renew, et cetera, our waivers, the, the timing was good. I think we, there was always um, knowledge that we had at the state um, around duels, but right, not not a named office. But I, I think, I, I don't want to overstate kind of like this named office that we have, because there are teams within the department that, that know about duels, but um, I think what's hard is they are pulled in multiple directions. So being able to, um, you know, put, you know, say, give credit to them as well. You know, like it's good that we have a, a dedicated team, but there's so many things that are really deep that our, our dedicated duels team does not know and that we have to rely on colleagues. So um, I guess it's, you know, kind of a balance between that dedicated team and then the other teams that we partner with internally. And I feel like Iowa, we're right on Tennessee's heels as far as uh, the kind of the upper leadership realizing that they just needed a point of dedicated focus. Um, like Anastasia just said, we have so many teams in LTSS and in behavioral health that have snippets or components of duels and know maybe a small and limited focus of what uh, might happen for their members in their specific areas, but we're just missing that overarching branch of having continuity through all of the programs. Um, so I think it was just a, a recon, a, an aha moment that there needs to be a point of contact, that this work is too big, the impact for our members is too important, they need support, members need support, and our, our vendors need support as well. Like they need to know that we are going to be a partner and, and work with them through this process. And so we're working on transparency and I think State of Iowa just finally got to that point. <laughs> Hopefully they'll continue to support that. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Uh, there's another question that came in that was about um, thinking about how states are dealing with the nuances between Medicare and Medicaid requirements. We talked a lot about building Medicare knowledge, and I think this question is getting a little bit more granular. Um, the example was, you know, Medicare does not require health plans to obtain um, written consent from providers to file an appeal on a beneficiary's behalf. Under Medicaid, providers do, um, are required to obtain written consent in order to file an appeal. And this just brings up that space of, let's say, using appeals as an example of where there could be better alignment and integration um, through the efforts that you all are engaged in. And so um, I was just curious if, if um, 
I don't know, California, if you want to talk, Anastasia, a little bit about like dealing with the nuances between Medicare and Medicaid. You mentioned earlier the duals office and MMCO and, you know, the work that you do at the state level. But I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, how you kind of negotiate when there's those kind of weedsy differences. Right. For members that are in um, the, the integrated DSNPs, we have integrated appeals and grievances at the plan level. And then both Medicare and, and Medicaid, they have plan level appeals and then external appeals. The external appeals are separate, but the plan level is integrated. And yes, when we launched, when we transitioned from the financial alignment demonstration over to the DSNP model, we had to do some intensive work, you know, built a diagram or what have you um, to compare what we had in our demonstration was on the Medicare side, what's in the regular Medicaid side, and then how do we make it integrated for the DSNPs. So we, we um, back to the ombudsman program that we have for duals, they are helpful as well in helping people navigate um, you know, if, if they're in an integrated plan, this is, you know, you have an integrated process, but there's a lot of people who are not. And yeah, it is um, um, complex. And that's why we have the ombudsman, one of the key reasons. Thank you for that. Um, I'd love to turn to um, uh, all of the panelists for just some concluding thoughts as we think about um, everything that we've covered and the ground we've covered. One of the things that could be helpful to folks is if you have either um, a piece of advice for state policymakers working to build Medicare knowledge, any parting piece of advice for folks that are um, trying to build this capacity, or if there's something that you really wish was available to help states address their Medicare capacity building gaps, um, maybe share that. So um, welcome if anyone wants to jump in on final thoughts there? Well, I'll just say that oftentimes, you know, there, there's policy windows or opportunities that open up sometimes at surprising times. So if your state does not have a um, dedicated team or individual, but you think it's a good idea, you know, it, you can sort of, you know, as time permits, collect some thoughts or bullet points or data points and then you never know whether it's a combination of, you know, you have a new governor or new, you know, something comes up, new opportunity, having those bullet points, having the the um, proposal ready at the opportune time, that can be really helpful because, you know, the demographic trends, of course, nationwide, this is a, a growing group and, um, you know, depending on if your state is fiscally conservative or not, you know, it's a high cost group. So there's a lot of good points to, to make about that, um, but you just never know. So I would say, you know, be ready. Yeah. Did did you, Lolita, come off mute? Did you have a quick final thought on this one? Or I was just thinking um, the benefit that we've received from the Medicare Academy. Um, I was so sad that that ended for us. Um, the opportunities that were uh, presented, having the ability to speak directly to the staff in the other states at the end of our sessions, um, those are things that I think need to be presented to us a lot more often to ensure that we don't feel so alone in the work sometimes. Um, and then uh, also hearing from Barbara today, I think is, is extremely beneficial. So always keeping that top of mind, getting access directly to our members whenever we can. Um, but just those two things, I think, really uh, would be the most beneficial for us. <laughs> You're nodding a lot, Susan. Do you agree? I you am, know? yes. It touches me deeply, Lolita. So it's from <laughs> Iowa. It just, uh, the, our biggest, and our most important point at this point is really just looking at DSNP to the health of some of our most vulnerable members. So we try to keep that as our focus every single day. It is a challenge to disseminate information to internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, but that's with any work. So I think the biggest thing is, is just taking a breath. Do find a network so you know you're not alone because there are resources out there and just, just keep just keep churning. Now, um, <laughs> speaking of that, we're going to go ahead and bring up the slides. So we can go over a couple resources and um, and close out our, our time today. But 
we, we pulled together in the slides for today's session and the recording that will be available online, we pulled together a number of um, resources that could be really helpful for state policymakers. Mm -hmm. We also identified resources that could be helpful for providers and health plan staff. And a number of these come from the Integrated Care Resource Center, um, others are CHCS resources, but lots of opportunities out there for folks to dig in on things that will support your um, capacity building. The other piece that we wanted to share before we close, if we go to the next slide, um, is that we want you to contact us if you've helped to develop um, evidence on what works when caring for adults with complex health and so social needs, including those who are duly eligible. So we'd welcome you to submit your resources or your ideas to the Better Care Playbooks website um, at any point. And then finally, um, I just want to really acknowledge the wealth of insights that were shared by Barbara and Anastasia and Lolita and Susan today. And thank you all for spending your time talking about this important topic. And you guys do a great job, by the way, just so you know. Thank you. It's, it's not easy being green, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.